Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Live from My Mother's Basement with yours truly, comedian Mike Marino. I am so happy to be doing this recording tonight and bringing to you one of the funniest female comedians working on the circuit today from the East Coast, but now here in California. This is Jacqueline Passaro. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? I'm good. Oh, it's wow. Listen, name. To, listen to that voice. I'm good. I think we got a role for her. <laughs> you ever watch my uh, The Adventures of G.I. Giovanni? No. You never saw The Adventures of G.I. Giovanni? No. Okay, well, it's my G.I. Joe dolls, and we do voices with the dolls, and we do some funny little skits, but we have someone doing the voice of Barbie doll, but we do need the voice for... Gina. Who's Gina? Well, that is hilarious. I didn't even know there was friend. a Gina. She, she could be Barbie's like. So you're making it up? I am making it up. She could be Barbie's like wacky Italian like mobster friend. Perfect, perfect. I love it. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds fantastic. I was thinking Skipper. You remember Skipper? I do remember Skipper. Nobody really remembers Skipper. She was you're the right. sister that they forgot to make sure, like a stepsister or something like that. She is. That's true. Everyone forgot about her. Maybe Skipper. because she was too similar looking to Barbie. You can't really tell them apart. I thought she was short and fat. <laughs> <laughs> no, they recently did that in like the last three years oh, where they made she, Barbie with all different Barbie types. She plumped up a little bit. I like the way this show is starting. We went in the gutter already. We didn't, we're not even talking three minutes. We're talking about fat Barbie doll sister <laughs> and, and some girl named Gina. That is funny. You know, what they, do you think about Bratz dolls? Uh, I don't think that's before my time. I don't even know what Bratz is. Those, okay, so <laughs> recently, um, so Barbie sales like go up and down. Okay, so there was a point where Barbie wasn't cool. Bratz dolls were cool. This was like six, I think it was like six years ago. Well, these Bratz dolls, they look like hookers. They have these huge lips and these skinny, skinny legs, and they're dressed like, <laughs> they're dressed Rappers. like hookers. <laughs> and they were beating Barbie sales. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I remember G.I. Joe was the greatest, and then they got beat out by almost everything, and nobody even knows about the G.I. Joe doll anymore. And then they became worth a ton of money if you could find them, and especially if you have them in their box. So I have a couple of the G.I. Joe dolls, and that's when I started doing this routine about G.I. Joe was not in the Army. He was a Guido, and his name was Giovanni. And he was the head of the five families, and he whacked Ken, and and, and Barbie doll was the Gumara. <laughs> well, we're gonna have to get you to do it because I don't remember Gina, Gina doll. <laughs> There's Barbie doll, Gina doll, and Ken doll. Everybody's last name is doll, except for G.I. Giovanni was Dalio. <laughs> He's the Italian doll. Hey, listen, folks. Speaking of Italians, we have to do this. We're starting this podcast here in the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday in Los Angeles, and we were lucky enough to get some food while we're here doing the podcast. And of course, Jacqueline being Italian, me being Italian, we might as well have some Italian food. So let's show everybody what we're gonna nibble on while we're talking to you guys, and you guys are talking to us, and we're talking to each other. This, oh, it's actually hot. You go ahead. <laughs> I burnt my hand. <laughs> <laughs> this is chicken carbonara, and I think it's with fettuccine, so it's fettuccine noodles. That looks absolutely delicious. She's having chicken carbonara, which I tend to not like every once in a while because I don't like the green peas. <laughs> I never was a pea guy. I hate the peas. And this is chicken parmesan with penne. Now, the sauce looks like, and I say gravy. Do you say gravy? No. No, sauce. you say sauce? There's going to be a fight here this afternoon. I normally would say gravy, but because everybody's watching, could be from different parts of the world, they say sauce, not to get confused. It's not a meat sauce, it's a light marinara, but this looks really, really good. And uh, we, look at this. I don't know what person wrapped this like that. It doesn't look Italian to me. Looks like an Italian joint. <laughs> it does. It does look like an Italian joint. Here's one for you. It's garlic bread. And one for me. Italian marijuana. Marinara. 
What'd you smoke today, marinara? <laughs> How high did you get? I didn't get high, I got full. <laughs> Come on, that is hilarious. See, if my mother was here right now, this would make her cry. You know why? Because this is a really bad piece of bread. It is. And we also have some grated cheese. This is crushed red pepper in a little bag like this that would make any Italian want to hang himself. And here's some grated cheese if you want that. And then another crushed red pepper. You got it. You got to have grated cheese. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Because it's just it's so true, funny. It's isn't from it? A package. It's, it's from like a package. Look at us. Look at how my mother would cry. Look, look. Hey, hey, look at, look, I'm drizzling. You drizzling? Hold your plate up here so we can drizzle together. Hey, hey, hey. Do we look like family? Who could she be, like my sister? Where you going? <laughs> right? No, wait. Jacqueline, you ain't going out tonight. We don't like your friend Robbie. <laughs> What's Robbie do? What's he going to be? Like All right, let's just try this while we're on camera. What would you what if hold your plate like this? Now, so we're eating on the on on the show, right? <clears throat> yes. If I was in front of my family right now, you know what they call me? What they call you? They call me. Come on, think. <laughs> a gavon. <laughs> You're a gavon because you're eating and talking at the same time. Look, she can't. Then she's laughing. Stop hiding your laugh. It's okay. Holy shit! It's good. Delicious chicken. Wow. I made this. <laughs> yeah, by clicking a, on an app. I didn't even click on an app. I had to make a phone call. <laughs> hey. This is really, really good. I needed this. I normally like a Coca-Cola while I'm having pasta, which is really bad, but that really makes you happy. It does. A nice plate of pasta, chicken parmesan, and your family. We're gonna laugh, we're gonna joke, we're gonna eat. And now I don't know about you people, I don't know about how it is in your house either. There's no reason why family can't eat from each other's plate. <laughs> we always did. We always did. What, did you, what are you eating? Let me taste that. Did you try that? <laughs> Get your food, get, no, my father will eat your fork out of my fucking plate. <laughs> and then if my mother is trying to get you to eat something, she'll always be like, mmm, mmm. <laughs> mother's a con woman. Mmm, oh, you don't know what you're missing. Remember that? <laughs> you don't even know what you're missing. That's the trouble with you kids today. <laughs> or, you know, one of these days I'm going to be dead and you're going to wish you would have eaten this. Yeah, it's sad when they say that. It scares the shit out of you. Because someday eventually they're not around and you wish they were around. And you can say to yourself where well, they're not around, nah, I still don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't stop eating. Is it really that good? It's really good. Wanna have, I think the chicken. Nah, I don't want to taste the pea. I don't want to mess up my taste buds right now. I'm stuck on this. <laughs> you want to taste this? I there you go. Taste. There's a girl steal your heart. <laughs> She'll steal your heart and your macaroni. That's good. But I do like this flavor better. I do like the carbonara. Yeah, I would think it looks better. That even might be more healthier for you. <clears throat> I don't know. So we're here in Los Angeles, California. And uh, two Italian entertainers from different parts of the United States. So where are you from? Okay. So I'm originally from Long Island. But when I was in sixth grade, my family moved us to Arizona. So I kind of grew up in both parts. Yeah. She's a Long Island girl, and for some reason or other, her family said, we better go to Arizona. 
Italian people don't go to Arizona unless they have to. There's an area in Arizona, it's called Shh. Nobody knows you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so how old were you when you went to Arizona? 11. 11? Sixth grade. All right, so you had Long Island in you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I definitely am, am very influenced. My parents are from Brooklyn. That's tough. Brooklyn people grow up tough. The city is brutal, and uh, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And there used to be a lot of Italian people in Brooklyn, still are. Um, and uh, soon it's going to be the third week of September when every Italian neighborhood has a feast of San mm -hmm. Gennaro. And all the Italians from around the world go and feast and eat like crazy, like we're eating right now. And then October is Italian-American uh, month. So we're going to celebrate and do some shows out uh, here in Los Angeles. So how long were you in Arizona? Until, like, after college. What college did you go to? ASU. ASU? Oh, yeah. What is that? University Arizona of Arizo State. Arizona State. What do I know? I went to Jersey City U. There's no such school. <laughs> I went to Our Lady of Fettuccine <laughs> High School. That was it. Hmm. What was it like growing up in Arizona? It's a lot different than the city, right? Um, it's very different because I remember, like, one of my friends one time was like, because I come from a very loud family. We're loud. Go figure. When loud I Italian family. As soon as they get out of Long Island and they're in Arizona, the whole state hears them. What the hell? <laughs> oh, no. Italians moved in. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, we used to always get the HOA called. We would get like the HOA called on us. The neighbors would talk sh like, yeah, because it was a very Mormon area. You know, there's Mormon. You're kind of like, they're not used to people like you. Yeah, and you're Catholic? Yes, I did grow up Catholic. No more? Bad Catholics. Well, we're, we were really bad Catholics, you know, because... I didn't grow up to the extent of Catholicism that my mother did. I don't like, think... I, I didn't go to Catholic school. No. <clears throat> no. Neither did me and my two brothers. We had to go to catechism, Sunday school. But we had to go to Sunday school until, I guess, we were confirmed. You make your confirmation, your Holy Communion, and your baptism. Then you're free to become normal. <laughs> 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 Once you get through all of that, then you can do whatever you want. Now I watch Joel Osteen. All right, so growing up Catholic, Arizona, Arizona College, were you studying acting in college? I studied film and media studies, so I didn't do anything really acting related in college. So then when did you come to California? I came to California after, way after college. All right. So did you start doing stand-up comedy in Arizona? No, I started in Los Angeles. Really? Yeah. I find that strange. I mean, there you are in Arizona. There seems like you would have a, be, uh, a great rhythm to say, hey, Arizonians, I'm from Long Island. Don't mess with me. And you could start like that type of thing. But you didn't? No, I actually... You know, there's a lot of comedy performance places in Arizona. Yeah, I do know that. At the time, you know, I never thought about doing stand-up. Um, I actually like made this documentary with some kid or with other when I was in college about stand up. And I never I never wanted to do it, but then I did improv and I really got like a high when I would get laughs. Well, improv yeah. to me was about getting laughs, whereas I know that in reality it's about building a relationship with the person on stage. But for me like I only cared about getting a laugh. So then I'm like, maybe I should try stand-up. So that you could be by yourself. Yeah. There's something about making people laugh that does have a euphoria over you that yeah. makes you think, oh, man, it, I got to have this all the time. Especially when people scream and they laugh really hard. You have some kind of power. 
and then it goes away and you're like, oh man, I need that. I need it again. Where is it? Where does it go? It's like a drug. I'm like, I need to smoke that joint again. Where? And then you end up going to clubs to find that. But normally people start at a really, really young age with the want. So you made a documentary on comedy before you were doing it? Yeah, in college. we It was it's hilarious. Yeah. But why would you do a documentary on comedy? Um, it was a couple of us, and there, one guy had a friend that was doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. So we did it on like him, like we would interview him, oh. and he would. We went to like watch him at a bar, and so that's how it came about for that. And I remember though, someone told me, and I think it was one of his friends. He said, "You have the voice for stand-up." Well, you kind of do have a funny. Like, a funny voice, you know, the the Barbie doll voice or whoever you said was well, Gina, Gina the Barbie doll or some shit like that. But yeah, you seem like you could pull off and I don't want to say this in a bad way, but the nanny type voice. Oh my god, I love the natty. <laughs> oh, hi, Mr. Sheffield. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to have to have her do a voice in one of the characters. You do more of her? Do you do that on stage? I imitate my mother. I don't really do any, uh, like, I'll like other act outs. I do <clears throat> my mom. People like my mom. All right, it's always good to do people in your family because everybody has a family. And as I was showing you the shirts before, the characters come from your real family. And usually why that resonates amongst so many different people is because they have a family too. And when you imitate somebody from your family, you'll see people in the audience go, oh my God, that's my mom. Oh my God, she must have been at my house the other day. That's what my father said, you know? So that's really great. So you make this video about this comedian guy, and then did you move to California for this industry? I did. So I moved to California because, with my sister, because I wanted to get into entertainment reporting. <laughs> Nobody says that ever. I want to be. I wanted to be a host. Of yeah. uh, of like the Nobody news. Nobody says that. Yeah, I wanted to get into like uh, entertainment news hosting, and I kind oh, of like a TMZ. Like a red, like a red carpet, or like, and honestly, like. Hold it, <laughs> let's do one. Come on, little improv now. Um, I'm Mike Marino, and I just showed up on the red carpet, and you're, uh, Jacqueline. you're Jacqueline Passaro of ABC. I'm Jacqueline Passaro with ABC, standing here with Mike Marino. Thank you so much. It's nice to be on your show. Thank you. So, what part of Jersey are you from? I'm originally from Jersey City, New Jersey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to prepare for this role? <laughs> oh, I've been studying um, my, the Meisner technique to play the role of Godzilla in this new Asian flick. Thank you. <laughs> That's so stupid. I suck at improv. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it would be fun to work the red carpet and have that microphone and go up to celebrities and go, man, you were really, really great. I did it first for a little bit. Like, I worked I for this um, Hollywood junket. I don't know if you ever heard, but I, I would go to, like, some charity events. And it was fun, but there's no high in it. <laughs> Is there? It's not, it's not no high? You, Why, you're because the camera guy says cut? limited there's no art to you ha, you can't just ask whatever you want you have to like ask their publicist publicist if you oh, can really? talk to them and you can be you have to be like can i can i ask them they have to like approve most of the time what you're gonna say so you really can't have fun with it yeah because i guess you would probably just say you know i want to ask my own questions and you can't because it'll destroy their career like I would love to have gone up to Johnny Depp after the trial and go dude she really shit in your bed <laughs> but I guess you'd have to ask the publicist can I ask if she really shit in his bed 
Okay, if you could ask, if you could be a reporter that had no limit and just ask random, what what would you, like, okay, so you'd ask Johnny Depp. <laughs> Did she really stay in your bed? I would like to ask um, Kate, oh, oh, she was a, <clears throat> a 90s model. Kate, she d- dated Johnny Depp. Oh, really? I can't um, think of who that is. Oh, God. But she was, fa- I would like to ask her when she stopped doing heroin. <laughs> oh man imagine that hey she, Kate not for nothing when you stop doing drugs <laughs> when, when did your teeth get back in your mouth <laughs> or I would like to ask Britney Spears like what are you thinking <laughs> like every day what were you thinking could you imagine that a talk show host going after people who ask the questions that the mass majority of people would like to ask. Yeah. Hey, Brittany, what's with the shave of the head? <laughs> Do you know you look stupid? No? <laughs> or the Kardashians, like, who is your surgeon? Because I don't think it's that, they're that good. I mean, Kim looks weird. They all do. They all do. I mean... Could you imagine going over to like Caitlyn Jenner and going, did it hurt? <laughs> I mean, how do you even get it off? It's like a, okay. and where does it go? Do you get to see it? Do you get to keep it? <laughs> does it get to go home with you? Do you, do you bronze it? <laughs> do you bronze it? Look at all these gold medals. Look at the bronze medal. Look at the gold penis. <laughs> Oh, it looks a little smaller. <laughs> it shrinks when you when you when you bronze it. And then what do you do? Do you do you bronze it when it's little or do you make it get big and then bronze it? <laughs> and how do you make it get big once it's off? You gotta stretch it. <laughs> we'll be right back after this commercial break. <laughs> this is disgusting. All right, well, more meatballs and sausages after this. But uh, when did the stand-up comedy come into your blood? So I took an improv class, and I liked the high of getting a laugh. So here in I, LA. Yeah. What what improv class were you it taking? It was at here? UCB. Oh no, kidding! So back at a school, college. It was at um, yeah, you, uh, what is it? Upright Citizens Brigade. Oh well, isn't that like popular, right? Yeah, it's really popular. The Upright Citizens Brigade. That's almost like the most famous one as opposed to the one in Chicago that's called? Second City. Second City. Second City, Chicago. New York was known for, there's like another one, and then? There was a New York UCB. Oh, okay. Upright Citizens Brigade. Is it still happening? Yeah, they're still, it's still in LA. I just remember I used to hear about it all the time. Yeah. It's really incredible. Learn how to do sketch comedy, improv. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, but not stand up. Stand up classes you could take at the improv in Hollywood, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of private instructors who teach stand up, which is a good thing for people to take. Maybe you can even learn the business of stand up, because this is more business than it is about being funny. So you go to this school and you learn how to do improv. A lot of people don't do the both, the both, both, the both. A lot of people don't do both. You're either stand up or sketch. Yep. Because they're a completely different, different. animal. Yeah. Stand up, you by yourself, do or die, no choice. Sketch, you might have to rely on somebody else, or they'll rely on you. And if they stink, so do you. That's got to be brutal. You ever work with somebody and you're like, Doug, can you give me something? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She's got a big smile, so she's not going to give us any names, and that's okay. <laughs> How bad was it? Well. I feel like I don't like it when I'm doing improv with someone and they put me in like situations, stupid situations that I consider like, what the hell, like in space or like, you know, like in some like nerd store or like video game store. (laughs) I don't know. That is hilarious. Some nerd store. (laughs) So they actually, in the improv, can make you go somewhere and you feel like going, ah, come on, man. This is gonna suck. <laughs> I don't go there normally. Can we just go to shop and write, shop writers? All right. 
sketch and then what made you think okay I'm breaking out of this and I'm gonna be by myself I liked that so I learned that improv is not about getting laughs it's about building a relationship with the person on stage I failed groundlings twice for that reason like you have to audition to get into groundlings and I failed <laughs> I got an F to get in so into so you have to audition to get into groundlings school and I failed so the just just so everybody knows groundlings is another famous sketch comedy school yeah it was around Melrose right Yes, does it, it is. still exist? It does. The Groundlings, Upright Citizens Brigade. Yeah, they're really, really popular. Didn't the Groundlings started in Canada, right? I don't know if they started in Canada. I just know that mm. I love their sketch shows. All right. And so I learned from that that I'm not good at <laughs> sketch at, Im at improv. And so I'm like, I only like getting a laugh. Like that's what I like. I like getting the laugh. It's that's the high in it. So then I went and I learned how to write. Like I took a stand-up class, really to just learn joke writing. Like because it is a science for sure. Like there is definitely formulas, and so that's what I wanted to learn. And then I did learn more about like the branding part of stand-up and how you you really. <laughs> really have to let them know who your point of view and everything when I took a stand-up class I was uh, a little bit on the cocky side when I went because I was already I was why is that funny I was an actor and I figure I knew everything so I went to go take the class and the guy goes what is your point of view what is it that you would like the world to know about you and I'm like I'm Italian I'm from New Jersey and he goes good and then I'm like, and then you give me my money back because I already, <laughs> <laughs> I already told you I would, I, that's I'm from that. But that's the way I, you do get into stand up. It does have to be about you and your personal life. So go ahead. And then. Um, so my personal like brand changed like three times in the <laughs> beginning. Yeah. Did it, you take a stand up class or? I did. So I understood how to write jokes very well. And it kind of evolved that I write mostly dark jokes. So my humor is dark humor. But. <laughs> Why? There's a lot of people who pick dark humor. Why though? There's gotta be a reason behind that. I mean, you come from a nice family, <laughs> right? How many brothers and sisters? I have one brother, one sister. Right, so perfect all American family. Where are you in the food chain? I'm the oldest. Oh, you're the oldest? Yeah. See, I'm the middle child. We're usually the ones who get into uh, the entertainment business. So you're the older. Okay. Where's the dark humor come from? Well, it comes from that I really enjoy making people laugh at what they shouldn't be laughing at. That. Oh, That's okay. kind of fun, too. Yeah, it is kind of it's fun. It's really fun to get them right. to <laughs> snap ahead or two. Huh? But What'd also, say? my family, we did find humor in very dark things. Oh, yeah? Yeah, like one time I, I remember my grandpa would tell us stories as a kid, and he told us the story one time. He was on a trolley, and he was talking to this guy, and then he looked the other way, and the guy, like, popped his head out, and no more head. So, like, he would tell us things, and to, to us, we thought it was funny. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what happened? So he was talking to a guy on a trolley, and in then the what, guy... San Francisco? No, this was in Brooklyn or somewhere in New York, and he, the guy popped his head out and then got hit by something or a car or something, and right. he was finished. So when my grandpa turned back to look at him, he didn't have a head anymore. And the body was just there? Yeah. And, and to us, this was funny. I mean, my grandpa was telling us things like this at five years old. <laughs> So listen, kids, what do you think you would like to be for Halloween? How about one of you be a headless man? It's a whole big story about how he lost his head. <laughs> and that's a long time ago because I haven't heard the word trolley in a long time. You think trolley right away, I thought San Francisco. But there were trolleys in New York, New York City, Brooklyn. There still kind of are, but I think it's called an electric car. They're right in the middle of the street or a train. And yeah, I always made you wonder, if someone just leaned out like that and it was going 
30, 40 miles an hour and a light pole was coming by, he would take your head off. Yeah. So that was a uh, short conversation. <laughs> she finds humor in that and calls it dark humor. All right. Did you use that in a stand-up routine? No, I never have yet. People always tell me to talk more about my You family. might. You would talk about the family that actually thought that that was funny, which would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> and people would laugh, too, because they'd go, oh, my God, that's our Uncle Sid. <laughs> Remember Sid used to talk about that all the time? Poor Sid, what happened to him? Oh, his, his balls fell off. <laughs> he had a bronzed. <laughs> Three jokes. So... Where's where the first performances? Uh, where'd you study stand up? Um, I actually learned for, at Flappers from Ken. I know that's yeah. Ken? Yeah, Ken. I adore him. Ken Is Pringle. he still? Yeah, he's the talent coordinator now of Chateau. Chateau. Yeah. Okay. He really made me understand comedy from a psychological standpoint. He was at the show last night. I know Ken. Okay, folks. There's a comedy club here in Los Angeles called the Comedy Chateau or the Chateau Comedy Club. And it's doing really, really well. And the talent quarter's name is uh, Ted, no, Ken. Ken Pringle. Ken Pringle. You should be able to remember that because we all eat Pringles potato chips. And I guess he was working at Flappers? Yeah, so I, he, and he was teaching a class. So I took his class and I, he really broke it down to where he's such a good teacher, to where you understand from a psychological standpoint, like why something isn't working or like about an invalid complaint like he explained you know you might feel something about yourself but if the majority of the people in the room don't see, get it like don't see it like maybe someone thinks they're ugly and they go on stage and they don't read as ugly so maybe they so it's not going to be funny they don't won't get laughs <clears throat> yes that's true because there's a lot of people that do go up on stage and they'll say uh all kinds of crazy shit about their sexual experiences. <laughs> and you really feel like going, hey, 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 you probably don't get laid that much. <laughs> and nobody's taking the ride. Is that what you mean? <laughs> Stuff like that. It's not dark humor. It's just kind of dirty. Or <laughs> dark and dirty and dingy. And a lot of female comedians, and we're going to ask you about your stand-up, a lot of female comedians like to choose talking about dirt. I forgot who I was watching last night, but... I mean, she talked about blowjobs for 15 minutes, and I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> no one's really laughing, <laughs> making a few people uncomfortable here. Some people are on dates. <laughs> I'm having a hot dog. <laughs> so um, I'm glad that you took a class by him. He is really great, and I saw him last night. I should have him on the show. He's, it must be incredible to teach a class and also be the talent coordinator and know who's gonna do good on stage because you had them in your class or you're yeah. part of their uh, clique. Yeah. So now where are you as far as stand-up? How long have you been doing it? So I've been doing it since 2016. All right. So um, now I have a show that I run on the Sunset Trip. It's at a bar. Um, I got to feature for Joey Medina in Arizona. So that was fun. How was that? That was a lot of fun in Tucson. Joey Medina is a uh, unbelievable stand-up comedian. He's from the Bronx or Brooklyn, and he uh, I should have him on the show. He used to be a prize fighter, a boxer. Then he became a comedian, and he also had a radio show here in Los Angeles for quite some time. Now he's on tour doing the Latin Kings of Comedy. It's wild how we all know each other, and I will shout this out. He's also an incredible film director. You ever see his work? Oh, he is. Like I watched. I don't. Th I don't know. He. I've seen like clips of. Um, I know that he's getting all of those awards. For, yes. Um, he most recently did a f uh, a short with two comedians who are acting in it, and they're phenomenal. Bill Dawes and oh God, please let me remember his name. I should have all of these guys on the show, too. They're phenomenal. Bill Dawes is a great actor. He was on Broadway. Broadway, yeah. And um, Eric Blake. Eric Blake. And it's just a, it's an unbelievable project. That should be winning, like, Oscars, quite honestly. Those guys are so good and so creative, and I didn't see it coming. It's one of those projects you don't see it coming. 
I won't blow it for you. And there's only two actors in the whole project. I want to watch it now. Oh, you didn't see it? I haven't seen oh, it Oh, shit. Yet. <laughs> I just see that he's winning. Uh, you know, I see his post and I see that he's winning all of these awards. And I'm like, good for him. He's so great. And I, you know what's so cool about Joey is that he's so positive. He is. He's very he's positive. He's been around quite some time. And he's a, he's like a hustler. He, he's talented. He's a hustler, man. When I first started doing stand-up, when I first came to California, there wasn't a lot of different places to play. And if you weren't part of the Comedy Store, the Laugh Factory, the Improv, you were probably going to do stand-up in a strange open mic in the middle of nowhere. So I cut my teeth playing black and Latino clubs. And everybody was looking at me like, what are you doing in this neighborhood? I'm like, why, is this a bad neighborhood? And I really didn't give a shit. But I got embraced by all of them because I didn't change my act. My act was about me, and it worked. Everybody thought, oh, man, you must be doing some routines that are good for that neighborhood. I'm like, no, I do stand-up routines that are good for me. If they're going to kill me, well, then what am I supposed to do? And I ended up doing uh, K Locos. I think it was the first white guy on the K Locos comedy show where most of it was done in Spanish and I was speaking English. <laughs> yeah. I did chocolate Sundays and I did good. Good for you. So and I didn't change anything. I just I did a lot of my family jokes. You know, I feel like so I really enjoy performing in urban area like more urban parts. Urban. Urban. You have to say urban now. When I was doing it, it was called black. You go into the black neighborhood or the Latino neighborhood? <laughs> because, number one, they really, like, engage with you. Mm -hmm. I really like that. And number two, you can say they don't judge you. I just feel like sometimes white people, like, they'll be like, you know, like you're talking about. We're not white. <laughs> We're Italian. Just letting you know. Like you, you can just I don't know you could talk about like a family member doing drugs or this or that and they'll like they won't judge you they for go, it. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. I'm proud of you for doing Chocolate Sunday. Chocolate Sunday here in <laughs> Los Angeles is of course <laughs> on a Sunday night, and it's an all black comedy jam. Used to be a lot more black than it is today. I just did it about a month ago, and I'm like, wow, did this get watered down? It was really, really high-end. All black celebrities came to be part of the show or watch the show. And you had to bring it. But if you did, that audience <laughs> laughs and gets their money's worth. They will stand up and fall on top of each other, take a walk, come back later, go into the bathroom, say shit like, oh, he didn't. <laughs> Yeah, he did. And it was fun. Mm -hmm. And you just felt so loved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember one time I bombed, like, <laughs> I was bombing really bad. So I get On off chocolate the stage. Sunday? No, no, no. This was a bar. And I was bombing really bad. And then this girl came over to me and she was like, oh, I thought you were really funny. And... It was mostly white people in the room, and she was one of the only black people in the room, and she's like, oh, I thought you were funny. Yep. So. Some people have comedy attitudes. I was performing last night, and there was this one girl who looked at her phone for the first five minutes of, her set, of my set. As soon as I saw that, I looked at her, and I go, you need to look up. Look up. Look at me. Look at me. Put your phone down. Put your phone down. I'll follow you right outside this club. She put her phone down, put it in a pocketbook. You have to let people know, I'm in control. Get out. Otherwise, they'll run over you. So now that you run this one-nighter, it's always great for a stand-up comedian in the beginning years to run their own room because you have control. You say who you want in it, you say how much time they get, and you get the majority of the time. Plus, if you host your own show, which you should, host it. I'm hosting. You meet all the other comedians, mix and mingle, and you'll get other work. I ran a 
Tuesday night show on Third Street in uh, North Holly, in uh, I guess it was Santa Monica, for seven years. Maskers Cabaret. It was two dollars to get in. Two dollars. <laughs> but we had so much fun, and a lot of those comedians went on to be celebrities. And who knew? Sometimes the worst ones made it big, and the great ones went and got married and lost their minds. <laughs> Which brings us to another topic. Now, I don't know how old you are, and we're not going to talk about that on, that sh on the show, but she's a nice Italian girl. Have you ever been married? No. No marriage. How did you avoid that? I just think <laughs> that marriage is really, it's for a certain mindset. So I think that if you're somebody who, you know, wants to do stand-up and stuff like that, then marriage might hold you back. It can. A lot of people ask me why I never got married. Well, in my 20s and 30s, I could have because I wasn't doing this. I really didn't take off in the stand-up world until I was like 35 years old. And now it would almost be impossible because I'm a little older and I travel like crazy and I don't really want to get married to somebody who has a bunch of kids from another marriage and I have to deal with all of that shit because that's what's going to happen. Um, it's also hard to date because you want someone to understand that this is a job. This is not a joke. It's a job. This is all I do. This is what I do to earn my living and I'm not going to stop. So at any given time, somebody could call me and say, are you free Friday? Because I got this. And you're like, yes. And you go, unless you're not free. It takes a strong woman slash guy to be okay with that. So, But you're extremely young. You have plenty of time. Um, you dating anybody? Anybody interesting in your life? Do you date in the industry? Or maybe you should always keep people out of the industry. Date somebody who's a, a doctor or lawyer um i've dated both uh, in the industry and not in the industry and i find that male comics try and like it doesn't last long they try and get into my um act i don't like it when they try and like they try to get into your they act try and like tell me to do things like change it oh if you were dating a male comedian he would tell you how to do your act or yeah like one one of them was like you have to you have to lose on stage and what he really lose. meant was is that i have to be a the more self-deprecating like a victim he, he he didn't get it like he doesn't understand that i am the victim in every joke i'm just not self-deprecating yeah i never really liked self-deprecating i mean i could see if you're you don't have much of a choice but then some of the guys who you would think should be self-deprecating, actually bring some funny shit out of their tragedies. Some comedians, they bring the funniest crap out of a tragedy. Like, you know, some of these comedians you see, like, I mean, one guy got no arm and there's a finger coming out of his shoulder and they just do the funniest shit and they go with it. And it makes people laugh because they're looking at it like, well, yeah, I mean. <laughs> but no. <clears throat> I guess it would be hard to be in a relationship comedy, uh, two comedians, because you could either really help each other and have fun traveling together, and most of the time, I bet you any money, there's going to be a jealousy and a fight, especially if, you know, the female wants to be the headliner. That ain't happening. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going last. No, you're not. <laughs> no, no, you're not. I had done a couple of cruise ships with a female comedian. Her name is Vanessa Hollingshead. Do you know Vanessa? No. She's a killer, and we flip flopped. So on a Monday I would close, a Tuesday she would close, and there's no animosity. It's just fun, and when you're getting along with somebody like that, and I don't mean romantically, I mean industry wise. You have a blast. So let's suppose in one night you were doing a show and somebody said, you know, I don't feel good. Do you mind if I go first? Like, sure, go ahead. And there's no attitude. Yeah, yeah. No, no ego. In fact, I remember we were doing a show and she goes, do you think I could go on stage after you? Could I follow what you're doing? I'm like, fuck yeah, go on right now. Come on, let's do this. 
Can we ask that question? You're a killer. And I would do my, and I wouldn't even do a B game. I'd bring the A game and say, look, I just crushed this place. Go ahead, get up there. Boom, hit it. I've always been very encouraging unless you're performing with another person who's an asshole. Because every once in a while, <laughs> every <laughs> once in a while it could be somebody you're working with that you that you can't stand. <laughs> when you run into an asshole, do you let him know exactly what you think? Or do you? No. I so don't either. Can't I'm really always say nice much. to everyone. Yeah. I, I just don't I just don't act too friendly with them. Yeah, yeah. Eventually what you have to do is just stay away because this is an ego driven business and the ego can really ruin things. What the people tell you ego stands for, edge God out. So let them edge God out and you just stay on target with who you are and what you do. But um, I always admired uh, female comedians because they do have it rougher than a male comedian. And I could say that because I cut my teeth at the comedy store. That was my home club for years. And what was it, like nine to one men and then the female comedian would get thrown a bone every once in a while. But there were some female comedians that were just hilarious. And most of the world doesn't know who they are, but they earn a living touring the world as a comedian. And then you got some of the women who went through the roof, like a Whitney Cummings or a Lisa Lampanelli. And, um, I love Lisa Lamp. Lisa Lampanelli's great. She's Italian. In fact, she had a friend who was at the Comedy Chateau last night, and uh, she sent me a message saying, tell Mike Marino I said hello. I'm like, God, I haven't seen her in a billion years. But she always was a very, very nice person and skilled at what she did, and she took it over the top. So, and now I think she's doing a one-woman show, which is completely different than doing stand-up. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You could be yeah. doing stand-up for a long period of time. You make great money. You tour the world. You make a lot of friends. And then you say, you know what? I think I want to do a play. I, I want to do sketch comedy back again. You know? That's real. I mean, you, yeah. might, you, you could be doing stand-up one night, and somebody says, you're right for the movie that we're doing. Yeah. I mean, that whole Fran Drescher thing that you did makes me think, oh, my God, we've got to get your voice for the adventures of G.I. Giovanni, and we'll, we'll show it to you. Do you do her on stage in your act? The friend? No. No? You think I should? Yes. I didn't think I was that good. Oh, that, come on. I she did a, a, what, a two-second sample? Do it again. I miss the chef <laughs> I made macaroni. Also, have you ever seen Friends? That is Remember hilarious. Friends? Yeah. The girlfriend. Of who? Chandler's girlfriend, she on and off. Um, she she had that voice. She was so funny. She was only supposed to be in one episode, but she was in like um, a bunch. But she would be like, "Oh my God, Janice!" Really? No, I don't know. I like that type of a character. Do you do characters on stage? I do characters in videos, like sketch characters in videos, but not. And I have done, yeah. So I, my friend Stephanie Tejada, she's uh, a stand-up, and she's been a, a sh on a reality show. We have a sketch together. Um, it's called A Sociopath and a Psychopath, and she's Richetta and I'm Angie. So we're like, we have performed live together. We're figuring out more of, you know, how to lean it so it's joke, joke. And I, uh, I have to confess, I saw these videos. <laughs> They're on the internet. And you get dressed up as characters. And I think they're great. I think you guys need to get bigger hits. I always wonder sometimes, you see these stupid videos, they get millions of hits. And then you see these genius videos and they don't get that big a hit at all. And it's so sad to see that. It almost feels like, don't put time and effort and thought into something. Just throw shit against the wall and make money because there are some really bad things out there. But I saw your sketches. I think you were dressed up as uh, somebody who was cold out or something, and I see your friend in it. Tell me about these things. You really should get those up and going. Yeah, we do. We have, so we put them on a, a platform called OFTV, and we put our episodes there. So we, it's like a talk show, but it's a spoof. We're characters, and then 
like the th- like we ha- we'll have like segments like a moment in ho story so we'll, so their segments are ridiculous and we're ridiculous so it's really a spoof talk show and then we do um connie and tammy so i'm tammy tweaks we're like these homeless <laughs> she's connie the crackhead <laughs> we're like <laughs> Connie the crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> and like we make videos of them as well. So I have been creating wacky characters. I will I love watching uh entertainers become other people. You know? I uh try to do my characters as much as I can. I'm working on a lot of new stuff with the characters, but um it it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you're a stand-up and you bring the character on stage. If the jokes you created for the character don't work, it bombs big time. And then they're looking at you like, what are you doing? (laughs) But I think I scare people the most when I become my cousin Michelle. Hey, I'm on fire. (laughs) (laughs) You do that in front of your family like, oh, dude, dude, what the fuck? Are you, are you, uh, I'm like, no, it's a joke. (laughs) I like the uncle character you do. That's not, he says he's not free on the 4th of July because he's married. (laughs) Independence. I ain't got no independence. I had independence, then I said I do, and that was it. (laughs) I got no independence. (laughs) My Uncle Tommy was the greatest, but that's what got me into stand-up. I used to imitate my uncle. He used to say the funniest things. And uh, I first got on stage and I said, let me tell you something about the world today, you sons of bitches. <laughs> you have no idea how good you got it. My uncle Tommy, he would go like this. When I was a kid, we lived in a one bedroom apartment with one bedroom down the hall. And there were 16 brothers and sisters. In the morning, you had to go to school, but we only had 10 pairs of shoes. So if you didn't get a pair of shoes, you had to walk to school in your socks. And we only had six pairs of socks between us. So in the morning, if you didn't get the shoes or the socks, you got your ass kicked by your father because you got up too late. (laughs) He really said that. And you were thinking, you had that many brothers and sisters in a one-bedroom apartment? (laughs) And then you talk to his wife, like Aunt Mary. Aunt Mary. Did Uncle Tommy have 16 brothers and sisters? No, he grew up by himself. (laughs) I think he lied. (laughs) He used to have dentures and he would take them out and scare the shit out of you and put them back in his mouth. (laughs) Better brush your teeth, otherwise you... I mean, you come from an Italian family, you can understand. Um, Do your parents enjoy the fact that you're doing what you're doing? You know, in the beginning, my mom didn't like that I would talk about her on stage and imitate her. But now, after they've seen me perform and she saw me get laughs imitating her, now it's a whole different thing. It's like she gives me things to talk talk about. Oh, yeah, you should talk about the commercials and how I saw this one antidepressant medication and one of the... One of the side effects is suicide. It's <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Maybe some people should take this medication. <laughs> we get rid of them. <laughs> Isn't it funny? We all come up with a lot of the same things because we see and enjoy the same thing. People tell me all the time, you know, aren't you afraid that somebody's going to steal your jokes? Well. They could take your joke, you could take your rhythm, but nobody could really steal an idea because we all see the same ideas on a daily basis. And, uh, well, what are you going to do, you know? But your own take on it is a a wonderful thing. Now, would you like to do movies and TV? Yeah. I would love to have a sketch comedy show where all of the sketches are dark. It's all, like, you know, funeral sketches. You know, people are going to a funeral and maybe, like, the shoe falls off the body. (laughs) Or maybe, like, they dress the body in something, like a Halloween costume (laughs) or something like that. Like, just all these ridiculous things to find you. I think death is a really great topic. And the reason is, is because everyone can relate to it. 
we've all experienced it. And when you find funny things about that, like, it brings people together. It does. And as soon as you said, like, a, a shoe falls off the dead body, I went right into a scene in my own stupid head. And you see, like, two guys wheeling a coffin around with a dead body in a tuxedo. And the shoe hits the floor. And I go, what happened? I don't know. It fell off. Well, put it back on. It don't fit. <laughs> Put put your shoe on the dead guy. You keep his shoes. Well, he's got better shoes. <laughs> he's not going to need them. I tell you what, why don't we just close it? I'll take the shoes. <laughs> we just wrote a sketch. Wouldn't it be hilarious? And then at the end of the scene, everybody leaves. I, I want to see my husband just one more time. Open the coffin. And he's barefoot. <laughs> what happened? I think somebody took his shoes and the socks. <laughs> Who took the socks? Uncle Tommy. He had 16 brothers and sisters. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be here all week. Come on, wasn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's not really dark humor. It's kind of fun. But it's still making, it's yeah. still dark. It's still making, that's, you know, that's my way of doing, it's dark with a light touch. There's a warmth about it, you know? It's not like... I don't, it, it, I'm still warm. It's warm. It's endearing. You know what a lot of people say at funerals? I remember my mother's funeral, I have to say this. Everybody said, wow, she looks really good. I'm like, yeah, don't she look healthy? <laughs> See the red in her cheeks? People She's always probably going to get up and walk. They always do. When you're at a funeral, they'll be like, oh, they did a good job on the makeup in there. <laughs> well, how about this one? Look how good. Uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? We all got to go. You know what? She's in a better place. Oh, yeah. This coffin looks better than the house <laughs> she was just walking around in. <laughs> Is this better than the pool we had? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why eat? It's funny. It's, they say you can find funny in tragedy because, you know, mostly everything ends in tragedy. And, uh, and it's up to us to do it because we're the clowns of the world. Do you have work with representation now? Anybody uh, saying, hey, let me get you in the game, let me work for you? I have had agents before. I don't. I'm not currently represented. The agency world and the management world is a, is a crazy thing, you know. And before the pandemic, there was so many different managers. Then the pandemic hit, and half those people had to go find another job, just like the majority of entertainers. And it's hard to make a comeback if you make a comeback at all. I had a friend who was a very well-known casting director. Now he's selling real estate. It's sad. It's sad. And then, you know, you figure one out of every 100 comedian is still pursuing their career. 99% said, can't do it no more. You know, you gotta hustle. Especially if you're a comedian who's married with kids and you gotta do the responsible thing, like go get a regular job that has huge insurance and health benefits. Yeah. So sometimes us unmarried kids squeak through the cracks and enjoy where we're going and what we're doing. So. Um, where you plan on going now? Where can we find you on the intranet? So all of my TikTok and uh, Instagram, those are the social media that I really pay the most attention to. It's just my name, Jacqueline Passaro. Jacqueline Passaro. Nice Italian female comedian. I don't even know if they say that anymore. Used to be actor, actress. Now it's just actor. It was comedian, comedian which I think is spelt a little bit different. They put an E on the end. Now I don't even know what it would be. What do you prefer? I just say I'm a stand-up. She's That's a stand-up. That's it. I'm a comedian. It's a difference. Stand-ups perform live only. Comedians perform live and in film and television. We're gonna do some really incredible stuff together. So tell us about this wiggle my right ear without touching it. I can. Oh wow. She's a female Spock. How about the other one? No. 
I think I might have an extra muscle. My grandpa apparently could do this too. I was really bored in like religious class one day when I was like 10. And I was like, wait a minute, I can move my right ear without moving it. That was wild. Yeah. She moved her right ear I only. I think I have an extra, I don't know, like an extra muscle. I don't know. I can't even think like about my ears on my head. No, I can't do nothing. No. There's nothing happening here. Do you prefer Italian food and Italian people in your life? Yes, I do. And I like Italian food. And, and I do bond, of course, because they understand. Italians understand each other's pain and, like, create the <laughs> wacky moms and being, you know, loud people and people who... I don't know. Like, I wasn't really raised to be phony. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think there's a lot of phony people in Los Angeles. This is the phony capital of the world. Um, Arizona is probably nowhere near as phony as the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> but don't don't get me wrong. There's a lot of phony people all around the world. So that's why we stay in the funny business to make sure everybody stays happy and has a good life just joining us clowns who keep you in a great mood. So we had some great fun here today on Live From My Mother's Basement. We had some great food. We had some great fun. And I want you guys to go out and watch live performances wherever you are in this world, be it Long Island, Arizona, or here in phony Los Angeles, California. Go see some stand-up comedy, especially this bright, young, fantastic, gorgeous, Italian female comedian, Jacqueline Passaro. Thank you so much for coming to Live From My Mother's Basement. We're going to continue eating, but we're going to say goodbye to you guys. So thank you so much for watching the show. Remember, you can see this show all the time. On Instagram, we're going to put it, well, I think we're going to put it on Instagram, Facebook, definitely YouTube, iTunes, Google, Spotify, Anchor, Italian American Radio in New York City. Just pick your favorite podcast app and check it out. Like I said, we're on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, and Patreon. If you got a question, you want to ask me a question, just go, hey, Marino, ask the question and I will answer it to you. I'll answer it to you someday, somewhere, somehow. You know, a nice big shout out to our producer, Tatiana Blueshell, for making a podcast happen all the time and getting the greatest of guests. Let's make America Italian again. Remember, you don't know nothing, you don't see nothing, you don't say nothing. And how do I end every single broadcast by saying the same thing? Ready? Don't take no shit from nobody. Here we go. <laughs> don't, don't take, take no, no shit, shit from, from nobody. nobody. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying watching my podcast live from my mother's basement. We're having a lot of fun and I'm going to have a lot of great guests on the show in the future. So if you like it, hit like. You could also leave a comment. You could subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch all the funny videos. And you could also listen to my podcast on your favorite podcast app like Spotify and iTunes.